All right. I'm going to go ahead and get us started. And as more folks join, um, we will uh, get going and people can say where they're from as they hop on. So thank you once again, everybody, for being here. My name is Emily, and I'm Long Live the King's Communications Manager. Um, thanks again for spending your evening with us to learn about Survive the Sound and uh, find out sort of how teachers and students and scientists are all learning from these fish together. I'm going to introduce our panelists and then turn it over to them for the rest of the evening here. We have Iris Kemp, who's a senior project manager with Long Live the Kings, and Nicole Parrish, who's our wonderful salmon education coordinator. And then we also have four rock star teachers joining us to talk about the experience in the classroom. Deb Brennan from Madison Elementary in Everett, Beth Farrar from LP Brown Elementary in Olympia. I am an Holy School District graduate myself, so woot woot. Margaret Portalance from Our Lady of the Lake Catholic School in Seattle, and Deneen Severson from President's Elementary School in Arlington. Thank you all so, so much for being here. And uh, we'll go quickly to over the uh, our question procedure. Feel free to put questions in the Q&A box. You should see that down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, you can either send or send anonymously whether or not you want to have your name attached to your question. Either way is fine. You can also vote on questions that you especially want to answer. And we'll try to move those to the top of the queue so that uh, we can get through everybody's questions and uh, satisfy all of your curiosity through the end of the night. We are recording the presentation, so it is also going to be available to share with folks after the fact if you would like to. And with that, Iris, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Emily, and thanks everyone for being here today. Um, I am Iris, a senior project manager at Long Live the Kings. I am also the back end data support for Survive the Sound. So I choose which fish die and which fish survive. I have all the power. Uh, today, I want to let you in on some of that back end data support, taking you on a special tour behind the scenes. Survive the Sound 2021. And my cursor is not working at the moment. There we go. <laughs> First, I want to send you all a big round of thanks. Uh, this is our fifth year running Survive the Sound. We were really happy this year to have over 20,000 participants, 1,300 teams. And in total, you all raised over $45,000 to support wild salmon and steelhead recovery. And that is just incredible. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the real highlights for us every year is providing this experience to schools, teachers, and students. And it is definitely our pleasure, as Emily said, to welcome a panel of lo local educators tonight to discuss their experience bringing Survive the Sound into the classroom. Before we do that, uh, let's talk a little bit about that back-end data, Survive the Sound itself. As you learned while you were playing it, this out-migration simulation game is based on real-life data from real life fish who have been turned into these 48 incredibly cute little avatars. These fish are coming from three watersheds in Puget Sound, the Skokomish, Duwamish, and Nisqually. And uh, I'm just curious, which watershed was your fish from? Uh, a poll should have popped up on your screen. Go ahead and click into that poll. If you don't see a poll, feel free to let us know in the chat. My fish was from the Skokomish this year. Let's give it just a moment for responses to come in. And Jack, when you see that you've got enough responses, go ahead and let us know the results. Hey, Skokomish for the win. Lots of Hood Canal lovers in the audience tonight. Nisqually coming in a close second there. Thanks everybody. We are going to talk about fish from each of those watersheds. First, I wanna talk about how we get these data. So this game overall is possible because of our ongoing research and monitoring projects with our partners at NOAA in each of these three watersheds. And this is uh, our partner, Megan Moore with NOAA's uh, Northwest Fisheries Science Center. We go out, we catch wild steelhead in the river. We surgically implant a tiny acoustic tag into their bellies. Our little steelhead friend here, this shiny little fish belly up right there, is nestled into a cradle that we built especially for tagging. You can see he's got this little hose in his mouth. That's pumping anesthetized water over his gills to keep him calm and secure as we put the tag in him. Once the tag is in place in his belly, we stitch him up and that's a really small incision. It only takes a couple of tiny little stitches. And then he goes back into a recovery tank. 
These fish recover really fast. They're usually up and swimming within seconds, uh, but we keep them in the recovery tank overnight just to make sure that they're fully recovered and ready to go back into the river. Then we release them back into the river to continue their migration out to the ocean. And as they out migrate, the tiny tag that we've put in their bellies emits an acoustic signal. We also call it a ping. We have a network of receivers that are deployed throughout Puget Sound that are listening for and recording each of those pings. Each tag has a unique ping. It's kind of like a barcode. Uh, so we can track each fish individually as it moves past those receivers. So now you know how we get the data that creates your Survive the Sound experience. Let's take a closer look at what happened to a few of the fish in this year's game. As you know, we started with 48 determined little racers from those three watersheds in Puget Sound, the Skokomish River, my favorite, that drains into Hood Canal, the Nisqually River, Emily's favorite, feeding into South Puget Sound, and then the Green Duwamish right in our very own Seattle backyard. By the end of the outmigration of those 48 little fish, only seven survived to make it to the ocean. So today we're gonna to go behind the scenes with three fish, Lulu from the Skokomish, Boom from Nisqually, and Sam Q Newsfish from the Duwamish. They'll show us some of the challenges that they faced during outmigration. So let's start with Lulu coming out of the Skokomish. Here she comes down the river, Heading through the estuary, she takes a, a little bit of a detour there, but she's coming back up north through Hood Canal pretty quickly, well on her way, passing Lily Watts, our LLTK's Lily Watt Conservation Hatchery, which helps to rebuild salmon and steelhead populations at severe risk of extinction. And then heading north, she's gonna come to an obstacle in a moment, the Hood Canal Bridge. This bridge floats in the water, supported by giant concrete pontoons that span most of the canal. Let's see what happens. She's got to the bridge. She's not quite sure how to get around. And unfortunately, Lulu dies there. So I mentioned this bridge floated on giant concrete pontoons spanning most of the width of Hood Canal. The pontoons extend about 15 feet deep into the water. That might not sound like it's very deep, but our research with these tagging studies show that juvenile steelhead like to stay in the top three feet of the water column when they out migrate. They spend about 97% of their time there. So as Lulu approached the bridge, from her perspective, it kind of just looked like this big concrete wall that she then had to take the time to figure out how to either get around or get under. And while she was taking the time to figure that out, she became vulnerable. You saw Lulu travel back and forth along the bridge before dying. And it turns out that's a really typical pattern for non-survivors at the bridge. So here's an animation of several tags that we know died at the bridge. You'll see they all do these back and forth movements over a period of days. This is not a normal steelhead behavior. It's actually a predator behavior, likely a harbor seal behavior. So what we're really seeing here, rather than fish moving around on the bridge, is seals that have eaten steelhead. The tag continues transmitting from within the seal's belly as it moves up and down the bridge infrastructure. Overall, in our, in our studies at Hood Canal Bridge, we're finding that about half of the steelhead that make it to the bridge will not survive past it, just like Lulu. Through our work and our partners' work, we're now developing structures at the bridge that we think will help guide fish past the bridge faster and also reduce steel predation at specific important points along the infrastructure. We're gonna be testing those solutions in the water next steelhead out migration season in 2022, so Stay tuned for those results. For now, let's move to Boom coming out of the Nisqually River. The Nisqually is one of the healthiest and least developed of the major Puget Sound rivers, so Boom already has a great advantage here. Nisqually's headwaters begin in a national park. The lower river meets Puget Sound within the Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge, which is the site of the largest estuary restoration project on the Pacific coast. But outmigrating steelhead like Boom often still face danger in the estuary. You can see that Boom has done these back and forth movements and died just outside of the river mouth. A typical steelhead during out migration is gonna move pretty quickly straight out of the estuary towards the ocean. Boom's tag didn't do that. 
It did this upstream downstream back and forth movement right at the river mouth and estuary, essentially moving in and out of the lower river along with the tide. So as the tide comes in, the saltwater intrusion comes in uh, up the river, the tag moves along with it. As the tide goes out, the tag moves downriver. It turns out this pattern is also likely a predator pattern. Harbor seals in this area move in and out of the river with the tide and they haul out on several nearby beaches. So seal predation in the estuary is also a challenge that Nisqually steelhead face. Instead of an infrastructure solution though, the story gets a little bit more complicated and the solutions get a little bit more complicated for Nisqually fish. Some of our current research in the Squally Estuary, supported by this long-term tagging program that creates the data for Survive the Sound as well, suggests that when other preferred prey like forage fish, these tiny little silvery fish like herring and anchovies are abundant, seals will fill up on those instead of eating steelhead. So here what you're seeing on the graph is in these green years when we had more forage fish in the area, steelhead survival was also higher. So supporting healthy forage fish populations might play a big part in helping steelhead survive to the ocean. We're now working with our partners to support Puget Sound herring populations and to deter seal predation in the Nisqually estuary. Finally, we come to our third watershed, the Duwamish and Sam Q news fish. Unlike the Nisqually, the Duwamish waterway has been heavily industrialized and engineered to serve Seattle's industrial and commercial needs. And even though pollution and habitat loss have impacted the system, it's still important for salmon and steelhead. And many groups, including us and our partners, continue to work on cleanup and habitat restoration. Luckily for Sam, he's made his way safely through the river. He's going full steam ahead towards the ocean, coming up out the mouth of Admiralty Inlet here, past Port Townsend, and into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Juan de Fuca's water properties are much more similar to the ocean than Puget Sound is. So he's getting his first taste of ocean water as he comes through the strait and crosses the finish line. Congratulations to Sam. We hope you do well in the ocean and that we see you when you come back in a couple years. The secret story behind Survive the Sound that you might not have learned during the game is that Sam and the other Duwamish steelhead in Survive the Sound were part of a parasite infection experiment. So some Puget Sound watersheds are home to a naturally occurring parasite called Nanophytus salmincola. The, Duwam the green Duwamish is one of those watersheds. Part of this parasite's life cycle involves burrowing into the fish's body. And as you can imagine, that, that might affect the fish's health or behavior. So during this experiment, we had one group of uninfected fish, like Sam, and one group of infected fish. We tagged all of them and we monitored their out migrations. It turns out the infected fish tended to spend more time in the river. They had a little bit of a harder time getting to salt water. We're now working with our partners to identify places where fish are more likely to get infected within the watershed to better understand the impacts of those infections and to develop treatment options for fish in certain vulnerable environments like hatcheries. Thank you for joining me behind the scenes with our intrepid racers thinking about the challenges that these fish face and the data that this program allows scientists to work with. Now let's take these fish into the classroom and learn more about what teachers and students experienced during Survive the Sound 2021. It's my privilege to pass the baton now to Nicole Parrish, LLTK's education coordinator. Thank you so much, Iris. So hi, I'm Nicole Parrish. I have been helping to develop and put together these education materials and have had the pleasure to introduce them to a bunch of teachers in the area, a few of which we get to talk to today. And I'm really excited about our panelists later coming from all over Western Washington. It's really cool. They're each from a different city. So before we talk to our panelists, I was just going to briefly go over a few of the materials that we do have available on the website, and they're actually still up and they will be year round. So they're not only to be used before and during the migration, although that is what they're designed for. 
So I just want to, why can't I click through here? <laughs> here we go. All right. So on this slide, you'll see, this is what our classroom page looks like. If you scroll down from survivethesound.org slash classroom, it will show you these learning materials. And it has the curriculum overview, which will show sort of just an overview of all the materials that we have available, the lesson plans and what learning standards they connect with. And then there's our journal where you can keep track of your fish with this interactive journal. Hold on one moment, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and finally, we have all of our materials, which include the life cycle, anatomy, everything from what a general watershed is to then looking at the food web of steelhead. If you click on one of these tabs, it's going to give you the materials for that specific lesson. So you can download these lesson plans. We have in person, um, if you're still virtual or doing asynchronous learning, there are materials for that as well. Some of them have links to a seesaw, for example. And this is what that page is going to look like. And then this is what the activity you'll be doing with your kids will look like. Can you hear my cat? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't, I, I don't know what to do about him. I'm so sorry. He just Hold wants on. to contribute. <laughs> <laughs> One quick second again. I'm We've all been there during this pandemic. Lots of, lots of guest stars. <laughs> I vote for the kitten to come join the webinar. <laughs> okay, he's a tiny baby, so oh, he's so needy. Okay, so this is what it's gonna look like when you click on each of those tabs. And then we also, if you scroll down on that classroom page, we also have next, here we go. We have other things to do. So these are sort of activities that you can use to take action afterwards, or if your students are really getting interested in this subject and want to know more about marine science careers, we have Q and A's with real live marine scientists. Iris is actually one of those, although she's not pictured on this slide. And we also have a activity where you can contact your local legislator and you can give them a drawing of a fish idea that your students might have. And there's a template where they can write a letter to an elected official and tell them how important salmon and steelhead are to them and why. Okay, so I just wanted to briefly go over those activities and materials with you all in case you hadn't seen them before and didn't know that all that was available for free. Oh, it says I'm controlling the screen, here we go. Here are the statistics for our educational aspect of survive the sound race in 2021. We had 390 educators sign up. Thank you so much. Of those educators, they came from 285 schools and organizations. So this also included homeschool educators, educators from public and private schools, and not only that, but after school programs and community organizations as well. And then those educators served about um, 16,000, did I have that right? Students, <laughs> I think I have that one right. There, today we have four 
of those educators of those 390 that signed up. So thank you so much for joining us. These are their teams that they signed up with. <laughs> and we're going to meet our teacher panel in a moment, and then I'm going to be asking them a few questions, and then we will just head over to the Q&A, and the public can ask questions of them and Iris and myself. So, Iris, if you would please stop screen sharing. Um, I would love for each of the teachers to please introduce yourselves, what school district you're in and what grade you teach for us. Well, I can start unless we want more wait time. I know we're yeah, supposed to go ahead. wait time um, <laughs> on Zoom. Okay, so I'm Deneen Sieberson and I work for Arlington School District and I teach fifth grade. And I'm uh, Margaret Ford Lanst, and I work for Our Lady of the Lake School in the Seattle Archdiocese. Good evening, Deb Brennan. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I teach fifth grade as well in the Everett School District. My name is Beth Farrar, and I teach in the Olympia School District, and I also teach fifth grade. <laughs> Beautiful. So I noticed that there were a lot of third through fifth grade teachers that did sign up for this program. And as I was kind of reviewing and revising the lesson plans, I thought that it was mostly geared toward second through sixth grade. And so I think this first question um, is for Margaret. How do you feel like, or do you feel like Survive the Sounds resources are well suited for your grade? And how specifically? Yeah, this was my first year uh, using Survive the Sound. I've always wanted to do it. And I absolutely love the resources that you shared. Um, and I, I felt it really uh, fit well with fourth grade. Uh, we actually study salmon, the Salish Sea throughout the year. Uh, most things that I've been able to find haven't been local. And I really enjoyed how connected locally this program was because, you know, kids learn better when they um, interact with things that they care about. Awesome. Thank you so much. Does anybody have anything to add to what Margaret said and also talking about how this is sort of within our own local environment? Did that bring up any stories anyone has to share about that? My students talked about fishing and um, we live near Nisqually. So um, talking about the watershed and the estuary was really exciting. The, the kids really personalized it and were excited. And so that was good when teaching remote. Oh, good. I'm glad that you mentioned the remote thing. Um, we are living in a weird time where cats can come onto conference calls and all types of stuff happens. And I can imagine that it's hard to fit this into your day, especially if you are partially remote, if you're hybrid, if you're doing asynchronous learning, what have you, even if we're in person during you know normal times, it feels like it's always hard to fit things in, especially during testing season. So um, Deneen, do you want to address where you fit this into your day typically, just the timing of what part of the school day you would normally incorporate Survive the Sound in? Sure. So we um, in fifth grade, as the other fifth grade teachers on the call will know, we learn a lot about earth systems and ecosystems and human impact on the environment. And so this went really well with science for us. Uh, and because we are hybrid, so I have my students two days a week, the other three days I can assign them work. And because Survive the Sound had so many resources for me with videos uh, that they could that I could assign to them in Edpuzzle. So I could assign the video, I could put the video in Edpuzzle and then I could ask them questions so that I could understand if they were comprehending what's happening. So I, I did that for their asynchronous work 
for the week. And then we did some other um, salmon related activities. And then when we were in person, that's where we looked at the different rivers and the watersheds. And we watched the drone plane fly over and talk about, oh gosh, what do you notice about this river? And I think it was, it's been a while since we've done it, but the Duwamish, is that the one that's really industrialized? So mm-hmm. we started with that one and see, we live up in Arlington. So we, a lot of my students haven't visited those areas or are familiar with those rivers. So as we were looking at that river, they were like, oh man, there's going to be so much pollution in that river. Look at all those, those things. So that was really, really kind of cool for them to have a conversation about these rivers. And then the second river we watched, I think was the Skokomish river. Yeah. And they were like, oh, this one looks really good. Look, there's some resting areas for fish because they had watched the salmon habitat videos. And then you get to the end and they thought it was um, a great river until I was like, well, now we're coming to the Hood Canal Bridge. And I talked to them about the bridge like, oh, uh (laughs) uh-oh. And so just those parts that you guys had already prepared for us made it really easy to bring it into the classroom with things that we were already learning in our, with, with our science stuff. So. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Janine. Um, That kind of leads me into, you were mentioning it has to do with science, and then you already talk about ecosystems in your grade. But Deb, can you speak to any other uh, subjects that this might engage with in your classroom? So what's really great about uh, participating in Survive the Sound is that uh, not only does it connect very well with our ecosystems unit, and by the way, I'm sure they'd all agree, we could teach ecosystems all year long. Um, But it also lends itself to um, reading informational text using maps and tables and data charts. Um, It lends itself to connecting with geography so we can locate things. I love that you have the maps in the resources for the teachers because as you said, if I just gave them a worksheet or gave them a website to the students to go to, to identify things, it would not be the same. They've got a fish that they've named together with their family maybe. And so they're tracking that and they've become very familiar with the names of the rivers um, and so much rich vocabulary as well. Estuary, um, connecting them with the videos. So in our experience, it is connected with writing, reading, science, math, and social studies. It's phenomenal. Thank you so much. I saw Margaret nodding along to that. Did you have anything else to add? Uh, so we have a theme that we uh, use all, all, all throughout the year, and it's uh, basically the Salish Sea ecosystem. And one great book that I love is from the Sea Doc Society. It's called The Salish Sea or Exploring the Salish Sea. And we use that in reading. We also use an, another a, a to Z book. I don't know if you guys are familiar with A to Z reading. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called Saving the Salmon. Uh, we also, um, as part of our service here at our school, is we monitor our local watershed tributary called Maple Creek. We're right now we're just doing it on Saturdays because it's COVID. <laughs> so every Saturday morning, I have a student, a parent, we go down and monitor uh, the creek and we have graphs that we've built from the creek. So I agree with Deb, just having the, the maps and um, having some data for the kids to like, uh, if, if any kid can do something authentically, it, that's just half the battle because there's got to be more more out there uh, for our kids to interact with, uh, you know, when if we can find more books or have more people write books on, you know, local environments, it's, it's such a blessing. So yeah, I, I agree with, <laughs> you know, you can, you can expand this throughout the entire year. Uh, I also uh, picked um, uh, the orca um, lily fish. Uh, because my kids were studying the uh, the southern resident orca whales. Oh, cool. uh, there's a great, um, the Sea Doc Society, if you join junior uh, sea doctors, they also have curriculum and they look at graphs of, of the decline and rise of the southern resident orca whales. And, uh, you know, we have such a, a, a great way to connect a local phenomena uh, to the survival of the steelhead or any salmonoid species. 
Uh, we actually have a sea run cutthroat trout here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, that is also important too. Sorry, I'm digressing. <laughs> That's okay. It all, again, connects to all these different subjects. Um, this one can be kind of a toughie. So I'm going to open it up to anybody that would like to share their answers here. But how do students react when their fish die? And then how do you handle teaching and discussing death in your classroom? Well, I think it's tricky because we all are upper elementary teachers. So like I remember the first day when they came in on that Monday and they saw their fish. And then I think it was the Tuesday, actually. I don't think anyone died till Tuesday. That was nice of you. Thank you. Um, but on that Tuesday, one of them came in and was like, Willie died. I was like, well, how did he die? And everyone was so interested and invested in that dead fish that it actually kind of softened the blow <laughs> of their fish no longer being there. And we had so many, and you guys probably did too. We had so many people on our team. You know, I said, well, how's your brother's fish still doing? How's your mom's fish still doing? How's the principal's fish still doing? That it was, I don't know, that, that part you guys had about how they died though, that was, if it wasn't for that, my kids would have been like, eh, now what? Like, mm. but knowing that it was eaten by a seal, they're like, cool. <laughs> they really got a kick out of that part. So at least for my fifth graders, and I know one of my colleagues is on this call too, our, our kids more got a kick out of it than, I mean, they were sad, but they were, I don't know. They, they understand the circle of life. I mean, that's great feedback because that is one of the updates that we made this year was trying really hard to connect that final outcome to a reason. And they loved that. I mean, all of my students were so happy to have that. I was like, well, let's find out how it died. And then, you know, there were some that were a little bit more vague, but one of my students who I was really afraid was going to be upset. He's like, it was eaten by a seal. Cool. <laughs> that is very cool. Um, I'm yeah. Thank you for that feedback. Uh, Beth, oh, sorry. Sorry. Beth, did you have um, another thing to add? I, I thought maybe we might want to hear from an actual, a 10, 11 year old and what oh. they think about that. So I brought one little video. It's 58 seconds. Could I share um, my screen? I believe so. If you there are. There should be an option at the bottom of your screen. If you don't okay. see it, let Jack know and he'll figure it out for you. So you, you're going to see a girl with long hair. Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay, great. And let me make sure I've got sound as well. Okay, here we go. This is Christina. Survive the Sound is a place where Steelhead, we donate money for Steelhead because Steelhead is a main food source for orcas. And Steelhead are very important. And they travel down the Duwamish, Nisqually, and the Skokomish River. And so some of them die, but that's okay. But anyway, that's part of their life cycle. So it like it's very important to humans because humans eat them and like it's a very um important fish and birds like to eat them and we donate money and it's really interesting and there's a lot of different type of steelheads names and survive the sound and there's a race and a contest and that is what survive the sound is Oh my gosh, that was adorable. Thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> um, there, so uh, the students were asked after the, the race uh, to just do a Flipgrid video like you just saw, uh, less than a minute, and just tell about what they learned. And it was a great formative assessment for teachers so that we can see, you know, how we can tweak our lessons in the future, but also um, note those misconceptions Maybe um, they misunderstood what we were talking about. And the girl you just saw um, is putting together a video for the whole school. And they're talking about uh, Survive the Sound and there's something fishy going on in fifth grade. And they, they came up with the script to themselves. And so they've been working on this seriously for two weeks because we try to do it before school. And um, 
they get the giggles sometimes. We have technical issues sometimes. There's been all kinds of things, uh, all kinds of challenges. But they were talking today, saying how much fun they're having putting this video together. So um, it's just such a great um, way to differentiate and scaffold learning for teachers, because as uh, probably all the teachers that are in this meeting. Um, will agree, I've got a wide range of learners from students at first or second grade reading level to sixth or seventh grade. But this event brings everyone together. They're all learning together and they can do it together. No one is embarrassed about their reading level. We can discuss and, and plan, you know, what can we, we're only kids, what can we do about this? And they come, with great, come up with great ideas. Hey, I want to. I just wanted to jump in and just say really quickly that salmon math activity was wonderful, and just I, I don't know if I should have done it early with the kids, but I asked them to figure out mathematically um, what percentage of the forty-eight fish would survive based on what we know in the mm -hmm. past, and then they figured out for our team what percentage survived as well, and so I think that they had a a good knowledge of just what was going to happen. And also my fish was the first one to pass away uh, eaten by a seal. So I think it kind of let everyone th just breathe. Okay, Ms. Portland, sh she got eaten first. So <laughs> we don't have to worry. <laughs> so yeah, that was a great activity. And we also do that uh, uh, salmon in the schools. Uh, uh, so we, we have an idea that, you know, it's, they're, they will pass away. <laughs> yeah, they, they were not worried. <laughs> um, thank you again, Beth. I wanted to ask you and also the other teachers in this panel, but just to give you another chance to speak on what do you feel that your students found the most engaging about the program? They liked the whole game, you know, I've been teaching remote the whole year. So un unfortunately, the kids have played a lot of games at home on their computers. So this was, um, it, my, my special ed kids loved it. And um, so they love just following that fish. Uh, I, I was really excited. So every morning for the five days, we started with the morning meeting and we would look at my fish and if other people's fish had died, then we would follow them. And they would just, it was, it was really fun and they could personalize it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And are you one of the teachers that have participated in this in the past as well? This is my third year. The other two years, I just got a fish and then the kids watched it in the morning. And this year I wanted to do more with it. Yeah. So that's awesome. I was wondering for those teachers who have done this in the past, how has this program with you evolved over time and what have you added this year that you might not have done in the past? Well, Nicole, you came into my classroom by Zoom and she did a whole hour presentation and that was awesome. So um, the guest teacher made it more real and also those um, seesaw that to use the videos and the, the PowerPoint was very helpful. Um, I also had the children use the journal, which they needed a little prodding to use the journal, but I, it, was, it was good for them. So I, I enjoyed the journal. Thank you. Deb, did you have anything to add to that? We enjoyed the journal also because we're doing this in conjunction with our ecosystems unit. And uh, we're also studying nature's network and food chains and food webs in reading. So, um, and there's some great um, interactive games for them to um, build a sustainable ecosystem in a aquatic ecosystem or a rainforest and they have to sustain it and keep it balanced for 12 days. And so those kind of things um, connected well with this as well. But, um, you know, we're wanting to teach our students, scientists make observations, they make predictions and hypothesis, and they um, record those observations with note taking. So the journal you provided was great for the students. We just assign it in something like Google Classroom, and then they each had their own journal and we could monitor what they were doing. So that was great as well. This is my third year also. 
last year was really strange. Um, the first year that we did it, um, like Beth was saying, we chose a fish and we watched the five day race and they were really excited. And I recall putting the email out, forwarding the email to other staff, but towards the end of the year, we're all busy and overwhelmed and thinking about all those last minute details. And so we enjoyed it. And then last year we were in remote learning and you know, right in the middle of the pandemic. And so once again, this was great for our class. Um, it really united the class, but we chose a fish and then we watched the race and we watched some of the videos. This year just really came together. I, I just feel like this was the most successful year because not only did the fifth graders get involved, but they would go home and talk to their families. And that meant parents, but also younger siblings in other grades. And they chose you know, family fish and some families got together and chose one fish. Other families, dad was steelhead and mom was Willie and then someone else was Jaws. And so that part of it was great. And parents would make comments. Oh, my student came home today talking about what they learned about steelhead or what they learned about salmon. Um, so I just felt like it was really uniting in a time where we really need that. We need to be united um, about something like this that brings us together. So our goal for next year is we want to get our whole school involved, not just one fifth grade class, but this, the school. And that's what this video, these three girls are working on is to put this out to our school to get them excited. Hey, next year, we'll, you know, we'll get you started. We'll help you. Yes, thank you. I have one final question for the panel and then we're gonna open it up to questions for Iris and just kind of end you all. So we'll still be able to keep the conversation going. But my final question is, um, how do you plan to take action now that the migration is over? So Deb's class is making that video. They're trying to get everyone else involved. Now that the fish are done, the race is over, how do you plan to take action with your class? And anybody that wants to answer can jump in. <laughs> we um, actually do a community waters unit um, using Islandwood as our curriculum. I don't know if you know Islandwood. Um, they're pretty active in the Pacific Northwest and we do the, the find a problem on the campus because uh, we've discovered that if you have more than 10% impervious surfaces, that means that the rainwater doesn't go through the um, pavement or the cement or play structure area, then you have a degraded watershed. So they, they look for a problem here on campus after they measure the amount of impervious surfaces on the lower play field. And then uh, they graph it and they actually, right now in my classroom, they've designed a model in a tub of their problem area on campus. They're gonna test it tomorrow. And then the next week, they're going to redesign it using some kind of green infrastructure um, solution. <laughs> and then they're gonna retest it. Um, and then they're going to put together a presentation about um, what we can do here on our campus to improve the water quality in the watershed, which ultimately affects the estuary and the salmon and the fish that um, live there and other inhabitants. <laughs> so Nicole, um, this year we weren't able to do it because of um, shutdowns, but our plan for years to come is we've actually, um, we wrote a grant to get a salmon tank Ooh. And we're going to be working with, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say another organization, but we're going to be working with another organization with Sound Salmon Solutions and with the Stiligwamish Tribe next Ooh. year to actually um, raise our little salmon eggs. And then um, we'll, we're going to release them in our, in our own watershed um, through the Stiligwamish Tribe. And I think after doing that and then doing the um, Survive the Sound, our kids are going to just want to know what they can do to help. Like, and again, this year it being really so, so, so strange with our hybrid situation. And we have so few um, days in person with them. I, I'm just really looking forward to next year and also knowing about it more, you know, this year it kind of like popped up. I was like, Oh, this is really cool. And a colleague and I got really excited on, on your first PD and we're like, okay, what can we do? And <laughs> by the time it got to it, it was like, 
okay, it's here already. We got to, <laughs> you know, the, the most we could do is get all of our fifth grade because we have one teacher who's also remote this year. So she got all of her kids on and it was just kind of a nice thing for us all to try and do as a fifth grade class, even though we can't all be together to be able to at least have that like community feeling kind of back to what Deb was saying and then get our administrators on. So next year, I'm just really looking forward to what we can really do in the environmental impact that we can have um, moving, moving forward you know, with the information that we have. So I'm excited for next year. We'll get there. <laughs> That's um, my, my fifth grade is going to um, write their ret left. Um, we use the template. So um, in two weeks, we're going to write to our legislators. And so. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. That sounds great. Thank you all again. We're going to move on and kind of open it up to some questions for Iris here as well. One that came from the chat was Lulu died. Do we know if it was eaten? Based on the pattern at the bridge, it's most likely that Lulu was eaten. Um, a lot of the work that we've done at the bridge has involved special tags that also measure depth and temperature. Uh, so with harbor seal predation in particular, what happens when a tagged fish with a depth sensor gets eaten by a seal is that you'll start to see deep dives throughout the water column, which definitely is not a steelhead behavior. If you have a temperature tag in that steelhead, you'll also see the temperature of the tag rise from ambient, you know, cool water, cold blooded fish, ambient conditions to a marine mammal temperature similar to our own, uh, and then go back down to ambient conditions once the tag is excreted. Uh, I would have to look up Lulu's specific background data to make sure that's what happened, but in all likelihood it is what happened. And the vast majority of tags uh, that become stationary at the bridge tend to show those kinds of patterns, the deep diving predator signal or the high, temp high raised temperature signal, or sometimes both. That's true for some of the Nisqually fish too. We introduced temperature tagging in the Nisqually last year. So next year's game, you might have some temperature tags in your fish. Um, and it, I'll, I'll make sure that the backend data reflects that in the fish stories next year as well. Another question for Iris, and this is also about the watersheds. Why did you pick these three specific watersheds and would you ever do another river in the future? I get that a lot from people, especially in <laughs> Eastern Washington. Yeah, and we've, we've definitely tagged in other watersheds as well. Um, Megan, more with Noah, who I, who I showed a picture of and mentioned during the uh, presentation. Uh, she does all of the tagging work, the actual inserting of the tags into the fish, and she's tagged at watersheds throughout Puget Sound. The funding that we have right now and the projects that we're working on right now are really focused on those three sy systems. So it's a little bit of a convenience. Um, it's expensive to tag, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort. Um, so we're really focused on just those projects. If we tagged other systems in the future for other projects, that would certainly be something we'd consider pulling into the game. But I will say that having long-term data records for one specific river system is really, really critical um, for scientists, for researchers to understand what's going on in that watershed and what's going on for those fish. So for example, in Nisqually, Megan's been tagging in that watershed since 2006. So we have about a decade of data um, across all kinds of changing environmental conditions and looking at that long-term data set and the surrounding environmental conditions, whether that's temperature, whether that's prey, whether that's predators like seal abundance, uh, allows us to draw conclusions about the system as a whole and better understand how Puget Sound works. Thank you. Another one talking about the data was asking if they're all actually migrating on those same days or is it aggregated data across many days so each fish migrated on its own five day schedule. That's a great question. Um, those of you who played Survive the Sound in the early days, say year one or year two, will remember that back then migration was longer. We had it on a seven to 12 day schedule. So this is, this is the gamification of data is aggregated and shortened. Typically steelhead are migrating out of these rivers over a period of weeks to months. 
So for example, we're tagging in Nisqually right now. We started tagging in late April. We will be tagging through early June. And each of those fish is gonna take about two weeks to get from river mouth to the ocean. And that time period varies a little bit depending on which system the fish is coming from. Fish from the Duwamish have a shorter distance to travel so they'll get, they'll get to the ocean faster. Fish from the Nisqually or Skokomish have to go a longer way. They take a few extra days to get there. Um, so to turn the data into a game experience that you can have in one week to fit better into the school schedule and also for folks' attention spans, uh, we do aggregate the data. We compress the migration down to five days. I do my best to make sure that it is realistically compressed. So we're not changing the migration pattern or the speed of the fish. We're just changing how long that overall duration is. The tags that you see in Survive the Sound are also a subset of the overall amount of tagging. So we only show 48 fish in Survive the Sound, 16 fish from each system, but we usually tag a lot more fish than that. So for example, in Nisqually, we're tagging 160 fish this year. Megan and I pick out the fish that we think are representative of the system as a whole based on the survival rates that we see across the entire outmigration season. And then kind of related to that from our own Deneen here um, is wondering, do you notice when the fish that are tagged return or has that not happened yet? Ooh, that's a great question. And unfortunately we do not. Um, these tags are really tiny. Um, we don't typically check adult returns for tags. We also, we tag more fish than are shown in Survive the Sound, but we're really tagging a very small portion of the entire outmigration. Marine survival is fairly low for a lot of these stocks. So the chances of us getting a tagged fish back in the adult return is very low. However, we are planning on an adult tagging project to look at how adults navigate the Hood Canal Bridge on their return. So stay tuned. We might have some more information on adult returning fish in the next few years. Can you call that beat the bridge? Oh my gosh, I love it. <laughs> or is that trademarked? <laughs> <laughs> if you give us permission to use it, I wanna use that. <laughs> Speaking of bridges, I think this is our last question. Um, do pontoon, just the last one we have time for, unfortunately, do pontoon bridges have a larger effect on migrating fish than normal pillar bridges? Or do we have data on that? It's tough to say for certain because we don't have a good, a really good comparison, but generally the impacts that we're seeing at Hood Canal Bridge, this floating concrete structure, uh, are much, much higher than we would expect to see at a normal pillar bridge. And in fact, one of the solutions that's being put forth through the Hood Canal Bridge project uh, are uh, developing plans to modify that bridge to make it more friendly for fish passage and potentially also better for humans. Great question, anonymous attendee. I also <laughs> wanna <laughs> I also wanna shout out to um, this, this one last question before I show our thank you slides. Can we visit LLTK to see your help with tagging? This year, no, due to the COVID protocols, but in future years, um, we welcome visitors um, to see what we are doing. We also, and this is going to be a really smooth segue as I share my screen, we also have videos up on our YouTube account of the actual tagging pro uh, process. Uh, so you can watch Megan in that video tag a steelhead. We have another one that I think Jack is posting uh, of Nisqually tagging this year. You can also listen to Megan talk about uh, more detail in some of the data that we've seen in our Nisqually fish and in our Hood Canal bridge in our Hood Canal population. And of course, all of the school videos for Survive the Sound are available for public usage there. Iris, do you have time for one super quick question before we wrap up? Sure, let's do it. How many receivers are there installed in the Salish Sea to pick up? Oh, screens? no, I thought you were going to ask me that one, and I'm not totally sure. <laughs> well, we can get back to you then. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, we can, Larry, we can get back to you. Um, I can talk generally about where the receivers are installed, but I don't know the exact number of receivers in each of the lines. Uh, so we have uh, 
a varied amount of receivers installed at river mouths. So for example, in Nisqually Estuary, I think we have 12 to 14 receivers installed this year. We also have some um, in the river near I-5 um, and another uh, location just slightly downriver from that. So we can watch fish come down the river and into the estuary. We have a line uh, at the Tacoma Narrows. We have a line in central Puget Sound, kind of just north of where I am in Seattle right now. We have an Admiralty Inlet line. We have the Juan de Fuca line. When we're doing Hood Canal bridge work, we also have a line of four receivers at Twin Spits. We have an intensive array at the bridge, which is something like 24 to 30 receivers deep. It depends slightly on the configuration each year. We also uh, try to install receivers at the river mouth in those systems as well. So it's a little bit general, uh, but hopefully that gets to your question. All right, so thanks again, everyone. I'm gonna wrap up by directing you to all of the extra information on our YouTube. And if that is not enough for you, you can find even more information about LLCK uh, and Survive the Sound at our website, www.llck.org, or by following us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Feel free to reach out with your questions. We love questions. We love following up afterwards. Um, this video will be posted on YouTube. So if you heard something a half out of your ear and you want to go back and make sure you heard what you heard, you can feel free to rewatch it. Thank you all again. Big thanks to our sponsors who make this possible and to everyone who's participating. And thank you, teacher panelists, so much for being here. Yay, huge round of applause for all of the teachers who participated this year. That's fantastic. Wonderful to hear your feedback. And thanks everybody for coming tonight.